ചാറ്റജിസിഡൻസി ലാസ്റ്റ് Anyway, I won't take too much of your time. Uh, please, Professor Murdoch, welcome. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Yeah, it's good morning. <laughs> And by the way, just the rules of the lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, type them out in the chat box. Uh, Professor Murdoch will stop at periodic intervals and we can relay the questions to him. and if it is very important uh, then you can also unmute yourself and ask the questions but i think the chat box will be more convenient okay professor murdoch please thank you very much it's really it's an honor to be with you today uh, i i just uh, i wish i was there in person um it's been a while since i've been in kolkata and uh I hope that our next engagement is face to face rather than um in the way that we have to communicate during this time of uh, coronavirus. You know, it was a uh, a real pleasure to be asked to present on microcredit and I thought, you know, I've been working on this topic for a long time and I had to look back and it's been almost 25 years that in some way I've been writing on microcredit um either very detailed studies or um overview thoughts and i thought well this will be a, a nice chance and it will, maybe it'll be fairly easy because i've spent so much time on this topic and i have to admit that in fact it was very challenging to try to pull together ideas um perhaps given that i've worked on microcredit for so long there were so many things i wanted to share um so many different avenues so many different paths and so i'm very glad to be here um presenting um but i recognize that in some sense this is only one one way of talking about these issues and you'll see a very um particular review of issues and so i'm going to present in the next hour a selective take on the past and the future of microcredit um uh, some of it will be extremely familiar to many of you some of it might be new but the argument that i want to make or the um the body of material that i want to um present suggests that the way that we've thought about microcredit for a long time and the way that i approached it originally when i was a young assistant professor um back at harvard um that that way has really been transformed we have very different questions now and a very different sense of microcredit and broader financial choices and there's a broad and big and exciting research agenda practical agenda uh but it looks very different from where we started so i'm going to share some slides and i will stop um every 10 or 15 minutes um to stop for questions so please do ask questions um and hopefully we will be able to have a dialogue so i'm going to present now um my slides and you can let me know if uh if this is not working yes it's working thank you so the very first observation is that the words and the frame that we started with to think about microcredit we often think about group lending early on poverty focused lending women are a very important part of um the conversation on microcredit a great focus on sustainability by which in the early days we didn't mean environmental sustainability we meant profit um so business sustainability and the focus on business investment and entrepreneurship among um among borrowers 
all of those ideas were central to microcredit as we as we knew it. And today, in in different ways, all of those ideas um, have either been diluted or questioned um, to transform microcredit into something else or to take the conversation into a different place. And that was very surprising. And I, I want to lay out some of how that has happened. So that is really the, the, the arc of what I want to share today. But I want to go back. I want to step all the way back really to the 1970s, 1980s, when this the challenges that microcredit were set up to meet when those challenges were first set out. So I want to start there because it helps us understand why microcredit took the form it did and why the rhetoric of microcredit took the form that it did. So in the 1970s, really in the 1950s and the 1960s, countries like India were developing industrial plans, economic plans, investments that were bringing resources together to improve the overall economy and to push GDP. And those plans were successful in many ways and um, had challenges in many ways. But by the 1970s, there was a sense globally, particularly at the World Bank, looking at data from around the world, there was a sense globally that that GDP growth was not sufficient to lead to widespread poverty reduction. And there was a fundamental shift in the 1970s that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that took us to what is now familiar, which is a focus on absolute poverty and the conditions of the poorest. There were uprisings, uprisings in philosophy with John Rawls and other philosophers pointing to the least advantage. There were uprisings in sociology and economics, all of which were focusing on, on poverty, malnutrition, lack of health, lack of education, etc. And we tie that back at a global level to Robert McNamara's 1973 speech in Nairobi to the joint meetings of IMF and the World Bank, where for the first time a focus was put on gender and community and participation and the role of NGOs. And that work built in the academy with a focus on basic needs and Amartya Sen's very influential work on poverty and capabilities. And all of that work in economics and development economics became the backdrop into which, or the context into which microcredit entered. Microcredit came upon the scene early on as an answer to many of the questions and many of the challenges that were being formulated um, just a decade or so before. So as microcredit came, as Mohammed Yunus and others were experimenting in the 1970s and early 1980s, these parallel conversations were happening within development economics. And so if we look at the challenges that development thinkers and economists were asking, they were seeing fundamental market failures at the same time, Joseph Stiglitz, George Akerlof, and others were writing the basic economic models that eventually led to their Nobel Prizes in economics that described why credit markets were not functioning. And they were quite pessimistic about the possibility for fixing them. There was a sense that inequality and poverty traps were related through credit markets. But in a practical way, it was very costly to target and find disadvantaged populations. There were concerns with big pushes, and there were concerns with the practical provision of services, concerns with corruption and waste. And at the same time, there was a fear that if one doesn't go the government route, if one relies on markets, that one may then be stuck because markets are not usually pro-poor. And so there are a set of challenges that were well articulated in the 1970s and the 1980s uh, where it was unclear that governments could really be in the vanguard of truly providing efficient credit at a wide scale, but it's also not clear that markets could do it either. And so microcredit came with a lot of great hopes and that has continued 
um, to this day. I think a lot of us were very excited about the possibility of overcoming those fundamental credit market failures that had been so beautifully articulated by economic theorists. The economic theorists were pessimistic, but Muhammad Yunus and others saw innovations that had been absent in the theory. And those innovations created the possibility of, a, of springing communities from these poverty traps, providing capital broadly, and not only that, but targeting women and disadvantaged populations. And Eunice argued, and argued forcefully, that instead of focusing on big pushes, one could do this in very decentralized ways, helping people incrementally um, grow businesses, increase income, and thereby improve education, health, nutrition, etc. And so it was a path that was, seemed as an alternative to the larger concentrated focus interventions um, that were being discussed in other quarters. Not only that, but Eunice and others were focusing on building efficient organizations. So it's not just about clever contracts, it was about the whole organization behind those, um, those village interactions, national level organizations that could spread and deliver reliable services and, and do this on a mass scale. That was truly exciting. And what I want to do is step back from that and look at some of the early economic ideas at a quite high level, maybe at a simple level, look at some of the important economic ideas that drove the optimism and were part of the logic of, of this basic idea. And I want to um, show how they came together and what they did and how we still are still wrestling with them. So in the early days to make sense of microcredit, which in some sense, you know, was a surprising triumph, right? That this just giving loans to people could really be transformative. That giving loans to people could change the landscape of national poverty, global poverty. That was a very su surprising claim. And the reason that it held, the reason that it captured attention came from a constellation of different, um, different economic ideas that were well understood or embraced at the time. The first is a very simple idea from basic economics that there tends to be production functions tend to have the quality of diminishing marginal returns to capital. And let's talk more about that in a moment because it's so fundamental to the rhetoric. But that idea suggested that poor entrepreneurs could have very large returns to investment. That the people who are in some sense, one would imagine would be uh, have the smallest returns, in fact, could have the largest returns. That was the argument. That was one idea. Another idea that um, was connected was this challenge though that small loans, giving small loans is quite costly and you need to raise interest, raise interest rates. A third notion, which is tied to Akerlof and Stiglitz and others who are doing economic theory is that even though there are these possibilities, even though poor entrepreneurs have the possibility to have large returns to earn high profit if only they could get loans. Against that was a deeper understanding that the lack of assets to use as collateral, what a, we economists would call limited liability, what Hernando de Soto and others really focused on, um, that that was a real constraint to expanding banking systems. And so we had this problem of moral hazard and lending and to a degree adverse selection as well. So those are economic ideas I want to go through in a moment um, to give a sense of the constellation of issues that shaped early thinking on microcredit. And I want to go through them because ultimately I want to suggest that the way we now think of microcredit um, is actually in many ways quite different. But these are powerful ideas and it begins with this idea of diminishing marginal returns to capital. And that idea begins with a very basic assumption that the 
production that production functions or in this case profit functions are upward sloping and concave like this they would take this form and what that does that increasing capital leads to increasing profit but at a diminishing rate what that does is mean that those first investments say a first hundred dollar investment you know could have a very high return and that the next investment a somewhat smaller return and the next investment a smaller return and the next investment an even smaller return we don't think too much about those those kinds of um, structures when we teach basic economics but it has a very very profound implication because it means that if poorer borrowers are left out of capital markets they don't have access to capital right? that a lot is being left on the table that if we think of the people who don't have capital as the poorest and the people who have a lot of capital as the better off population something surprising emerges that in this region of profit functions which is the region where most poor people are operating because they don't have much capital they're only getting access to the initial increments that they need to invest that that population can have the highest returns and much higher returns than better off people who um, already have a lot of capital this piece of rhetoric which i I'm not asserting is necessarily true, held a lot of sway in people's minds. It was part of understanding how microcredit worked. And so it pushed the idea that small loans can generate very high profits, very high returns, if only we could find a way to get loans to small scale borrowers. And with that, an understanding that lack of capital constrains economic growth and creates inequalities. And with that, an understanding that poor borrowers can pay high interest rates and still have a surplus if only we could find a way to get loans to them. And this is what was the basis then of creating possible business models. If one thinks about the political triumphs of microcredit, kind of the important steps to make microcredit work, raising interest rates, was one of the hardest arguments, but one of the most important arguments in the history of microcredit because it allowed for much, much more flexible organizations that could cover most of their costs. The lenders could cover most of their costs or perhaps even earn a profit. That was profound. And before microcredit, that was not obvious. And the argument for it really is found here with this basic piece of economic logic. And so that um, becomes really one building block of understanding the past of microcredit. So that's one, that poor borrowers can pay high interest rates and the need for poor borrowers to pay high, high interest rates comes from the fact that if fixed costs are fairly high, that for a bank to cover their costs, they just need to raise high interest rates just as a matter of accounting. So making small loans with high fixed costs requires high interest rates. So if we think about a loan where there's a, say, a fixed cost of 2,000 rupees and a capital cost you know, for each unit of like 3%, say, that a 10,000 rupee loan made for a year, which would roughly have an interest rate, need a interest rate of 23% in order just to cover the cost, the fixed costs of making that loan finding borrowers, working with borrowers, all of those transactions together with the capital costs um, associated with lending. That making bigger loans to better off people, maybe a 50,000 rupee loan, could have a lower interest rate because those fixed costs are spread further. So this is another very simple point, a very basic point, but it's a profound point, so I don't want to skip over it quickly. So on one hand, we have this argument that diminishing marginal returns to capital means that people can pay high interest rates. And here we have a, another set of issues that shows that, they, that poorer borrowers have to pay high interest rates unless they're subsidized. 
have to pay high interest rates because of the nature of the business model, because small scale loans with high fixed costs um, require high interest rates. And with this is a big tension for micro lenders because if they're squeezed and they need to earn profits themselves, there's always a, a push to make bigger loans to better off customers um, in order to have um, uh, higher profit margins, that lending in small scales is difficult. So those are two parts of the story. And the third part that I want to, the third of many parts, but the third part that I want to highlight here um, has to do with moral hazard and the way that that was created. Right? So when we think about lending, I suggested an argument that said, well, poor borrowers can pay high interest rates. And an argument that we just went through that poor borrowers have to pay high interest rates in order to cover costs. But as microcredit was being created, there was a third kind of issue that complicated all of this. And that was an issue that was kind of emerging through our understandings of the economics of information, of moral hazard, of adverse selection, that as interest rates go up, a challenge emerges as incentives start to worsen. The economics of information helped us see that raising interest rates um, actually could undermine the whole process. And that was the box that early innovators were in. The reason why in raising interest rates was going to be a problem, and here we have this a standard kind of chart that economists might look to, and I'll spend a little bit more time with this, but we have interest rates on the horizontal axis. So as you go to the right, you're raising interest rates, and then the lenders expected profit on the vertical axis. And so as you raise the interest rate, expected profits ought to go up, that light blue line. But what we came to see is that as you raise interest rates, then borrowers keep less of the revenue that they've generated from their businesses. And as they keep less and less of the revenue because they're paying more and more interest, they, uh, they have less incentive to work hard to uh, repay the loans, that's moral hazard. And so we have these countervailing uh, pressures and forces, and we end up with a curve that looks like this. You could start at point A as a bank charging a low interest rate, you're off to the left and you raise your interest rates up to point B and you're doing well, but that may not be enough to be profitable. So you wanna raise your interest rates more, but then you might really get into trouble with worsening incentives and actually your expected profit might start to dip. And the question is whether at point B is lending feasible, is lending for the bank, um, would it be a profitable situation. And in the 1970s and 80s, in those early models of, that came out of the economics of information, we saw lots of cases where, in fact, no, the market fails. Lending is not profitable that, that at that highest rate, say, whatever it might be, 10%, right, before moral hazard kicks in, the highest feasible interest rate is still not profitable. That was a profound shift in economics has really opened up the entire economics of information. Um, examples like this and problems like this that were happening because of incentives and the lack of collateralizable assets in this case um, to, uh, to improve incentives. And along came microcredit. And this was truly an uprising in economics and we see sort of broader um, shifts based on microcredit. But what microcredit, the way we can see microcredit and the innovations, a very simple characterization, is it could go from this situation where lending is not profitable, where the market fundamentally fails, and then have an innovation. And it, we can depict it like this, that what Eunice and the other pioneers were doing was to reduce costs, reduce those fixed costs so that interest rates don't have to go up so high but that's only possible to some degree. So weekly village-based meetings, getting rid of bank branches, et cetera, that was one part of it. 
but then contractual innovations like group lending to reduce moral hazard fundamentally and make it possible to raise interest rates without worsening incentives. And we can see my group lending, although it's not often discussed this way, but see group lending as a way to raise interest rates without the whole system falling apart. And so I'm gonna stop now, and that, that might get us up to 24%, which is a very standard interest rate, say in Bangladesh. Um, and that becomes sustainable. So I'm gonna stop in a moment, um, but I just wanna pull this together, that the innovations then were focusing, taking those ideas, focusing on a target market, seeing poor households as frustrated entrepreneurs who had been squeezed out of capital markets, but who had the potential to earn high profits, generate higher incomes and improve their lives, to focus on non-farm enterprise rather than farms. That was another really important step, non-farm enterprise where those profits could be greatest and most stable and to focus on women who had been particularly squeezed out of capital markets. All of those steps were important in addition to the pieces I laid out. To create these innovations, to overcome moral hazard, adverse selection, to raise interest rates, to become more businesslike, and to shift a rhetoric toward poverty alleviation, to see group lending, which we'll talk about more in a moment, as empowering, and in a very surprising move in, in many ways, but to recast debt through these mechanisms as a path to emancipation, as a path to poverty reduction, as a path to a better life. And so I wanna stop there. This is really in, in some ways the past of microcredit, where we started. And from here, I wanna uh, build, a, build a somewhat different story. So I'm gonna stop here um, and I will take questions or clarifications if there are any. Okay, there's one question. Uh, one minute, please. Uh, can you explain the microcredit innovation on moral hazards once again? Ayush Mitri is asking this. He's one of our PG students. Indra, I'll come to you later. Yeah, that's a great question. I will. Um... I'm actually, I'll, I will come to that actually in the, after this pause. Um, so let me hold on to that um, in just one moment. But that's a, an important question. Indra, did you have a question? Yes, if I may. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, Jonathan, um, if you are going to talk about um, kind of networks uh, these, uh, uh, these people may have. Uh, Typically, they are from one single village, um, the group that is, uh, but also the network uh, matters a lot. So I wondered if you are going to talk about network as well. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the answer actually is, is no. Uh, I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> you know, this morning or this evening for you, um, there are so many different angles. I, I It's possible to go down. And um, so I'm going to focus more selectively on a, a narrower set of issues which have to do with, with cash flows and sort of individual problems rather than networks. Um, but th that's very important. And perhaps you know, by email, we can discuss some of the interesting issues on, on networks. But it's a good question, yeah. uh, but time wasn't going to allow it. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hello. I'm somewhat I'm somewhere in the middle, by the way. I'm 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 in the UK, so it's uh, early afternoon for me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> tea time, I guess, in the UK. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Uh, hi. So actually, hi, hi. So uh, oh. my primary work definitely uh, revolves around microfinance. So, so there is often a question that of. I mean, sometimes it comes to my mind, and thankfully I got a chance to talk to Professor Yunus once. Now, the question that uh, often bothers me is that you know, in your slide also you've written that 
women as a reliable uh, customer. I understand that uh, there are empowerment issues and, uh, you know, uh, there are grounds on sociology and stuff. But, you know, as a, if you think from a banker's perspective, I mean, I mean, why is it like the women always a target? I mean, is it because they are less mobile or, I mean, technically they should not like be uh, less risky customers. I mean, why exactly, like, I mean, I asked Professor Yunus, like, why, why was it started? So his, his, his argument was mostly uh, on empowerment grounds. But from banking perspective, do you think like, uh, like right now, like in most of the individual lending also, they are gradually moving on to, you know, mixed groups. Uh, in India, there are various uh, microfinance institutions also who are having mixed groups. So initially, when it started, just uh, just like I'm, I'm always curious, why was why why was it like always women? So you know, it, it is interesting when uh, when Grameen Bank started in Bangladesh, it was it was fifty fifty men and women um, originally, and it was only over a few years that they shifted to being ninety eight percent women. Yeah, my sense of it is that while Eunice uses a lot of language around empowerment um, and a very positive language, but in fact, a big part of it is that from a banker's perspective, women were seen as uh, having fewer outside options. And in that sense, uh, valuing the services more, but also uh, being more reliable in the sense of being less, having less power to be the bank. So I think there's a, uh, I wouldn't call it a negative story, but I think there's a story in which from a banking perspective, women were seen as um, having less bargaining power and thus being more reliable. So uh, can, I, can I just uh, add on to that? So what happens is that uh, like uh, even in India, I mean, when a woman gets uh, access to the credit, uh, it's not often that she gets to use the money. I mean, often it's a family uh, endowment that increases. So uh, like, it could have been, I mean, it, I just wonder, like, I mean, uh, why, I mean, if you give out the loan to a woman and the family uses it, the money, I mean, you could have always given the money to, like, anybody in the family. I mean, that's, I, I mean, I, I, I might be dragging a little. So maybe in your discussion we'll come across, yeah. Yeah, I, I would like to come back to this. Um, but I, I agree. I, I mean, I thank you. Um, I, I do want to come back to this. I agree. I, I think that what happens, um, even though there's a lot of uh, language of empowerment, is that, uh, and there's work in particularly anthropological, sociological work in South India, um, arguing that, in fact, often what happens is that women are borrowing for primarily to manage household cash flows and that the burdens of debt fall upon their shoulders more than others, even though they're borrowing for household welfare, they're borrowing for the entire household, but the pressures to repay, the burdens of repayment fall disproportionately on their shoulders. And um, I think there's a set of issues that need to be taken more seriously. So okay. let me hold on that. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let me go forward. Let's talk a little bit about moral hazard and um, solidarity groups. I hear in the background um, some noise, so if... Yeah, yeah, there's one other, other question. Ah, okay, great, thank you. Uh, Yuti Bhattacharya, she's one of our UG students. Uh, you Hi. initially said that the increasing return rhetoric is not necessarily true. Could you el elaborate on that? Yes, I and I will. will. <laughs> if you give me a few minutes, I will. Um, just a few more slides. Yeah, and I, I had one question, if I may. Sorry, the interruption is a bit late. Please. Um, you said that, uh, I mean, in this particular slide, the poor household is a frustrated entrepreneur because the banking sector is unable to address the demand for capital. And the reason is the high fixed cost. Uh, but why can't traditional money lending institutes solve this uh, demand issue? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I, I want to underscore that this is um, 
you know, this view is not necessarily my view. This is the view that, you know, the, of traditional microcredit um, of poor households as frustrated entrepreneurs. Um, I'm going to argue uh, in a few minutes that, you know, the, the challenge often is cash flow management more generally rather than entrepreneurship. Um, but the question about money lenders, I mean, money lenders are, uh, are very local. They have good information. They have processes. They have a long history often with um, people in the community. But their, their information and their networks are usually very localized. And I think that the genius of microcredit in many ways was to take the, some of the advantages that micro lenders have which is local information and um, local relationships and to be able to build on them. But, and this is the, f the fundamental part, to bring money from outside, to fundamentally intermediate. And that allows interest rates to fall and that allows a more business-like broader um, operation. You know, one possibility that had been discussed early on was to hire money lenders to be agents of microcredit because they have all this information and they have all these networks, why shouldn't they, they could be the lenders themselves using the money from outside. But I think as things progressed, it became clear that that would just create another layer of moral hazard, but it would be the moral hazard between the money lender and the microcredit institution. And so ultimately micro lenders were sort of cut out of this and were seen as um, sort of independent agents and at the, the that the job of microcredit was to really to replace them or supplement them, right? In truth, what we've seen is often microcredit comes and <laughs> generates more business for money lenders, um, but that's another conversation. Does that answer the basic question? Uh, Professor Mardak, I have a question to you. May I ask it? Yes, please. please. Uh, this is Joita from Presidency University. And I have a question uh, regarding this group lending. So when uh, a group is formed, the group members are often related to each other by some kind of social ties, either the friendship ties or neighborhood ties or family ties or extended family ties, or sometimes by indirect links. Needed worthiness of a group member is already known to the uh, group leader and which reduces the riskiness of lending. So is there any study or uh, uh, is there any paper which explores this role of social networks behind this uh, group lending, which makes this uh, successful? Probably. You know, it's interesting that really not very much within economics. Um, that I'm familiar with, it's a good question. I mean, I th most of the work now is looking at how groups are falling apart rather than what's making them successful. Um, but it's a good question, but I don't have a good answer. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanna talk now a little bit more about group lending. So why don't I continue? Um, because I actually want to argue that groups um, have become less and less important um, because of inbuilt tensions within the group lending structure. And it may well be that um, you don't actually need the formal groups um, because you still have the networks. And perhaps that's one um, response to the question. But so let me just say a few things. Um, I, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here. Um, you know, there's a question about moral hazard and, and microcredit. How does that work? And uh, you're familiar with the basic group structure. Um, it takes different forms, it takes particular forms with SHGs, it takes particular forms with Grameen Bank-like structures. But, you know, the original idea was that groups come together, they're formed, and that people borrow for their own purposes. And it's not that they're formally responsible for the loans of others, but that if any of them fail to repay their loans, then none of them get future access to future lending. And it's that which creates incentives for screening and monitoring and enforcing and insuring. And to answer the 
to get back to that question, that the fact that the groups are um, are doing all of that work that the bank would usually have to do, screening, monitoring, enforcing, and insuring, um, is what reduces adverse selection and moral hazard. And it's that which allows the bank to cut its costs and to feel more secure raising interest rates without undermining incentives. Right? So that's the way that you know traditionally it um, has been formulated in economics. And we can write down more theory that uh, shows how this, this improves equilibrium. And we see this around the world right? in different places, different locations, that some version of these groups um, has been transformative and has been a key to beginning microcredit. But our sense on group lending has radically changed. You know, our understanding is that peer pressure right, was substituting for collateral. And so the idea of it originally was that peer pressure um, is something that can be used in a constructive way rather than a negative way. That group members have better information on each other than does the lender. And that the incentives are there to for everyone to band together and to keep a clean group record. Okay. So those ideas are um, are important, but in the early days, I think what was underemphasized was the challenges that later emerged. It's very hard to keep groups together when members' aspirations, when the investment sizes, when their risks are different. So groups work much less well when there's heterogeneity. And over time, we see increasingly diversity in groups. And so Grameen Bank, for example, no longer has joint liability. They rely on other mechanisms. Groups also have difficulty when there are, when there are risks. If one member um, is sick or their husband or family member is sick, um, if other things happen, there's a question, who's going to then bear the risk? Who should bear the risk? Well, from an efficiency standpoint, it's really the bank. It's really the, the larger organization should bear that risk. They can spread it more broadly. Um, but the idea of joint liability makes that less clear and that created tensions in these contracts as well. And the groups also imposed costs on borrowers and you know, increasingly borrowers did not want to pay those costs, did not want to shoulder those costs. So in practice, group lending, while it was the starting point of microcredit, right, was the most celebrated part of microcredit, group lending with joint liability, you know, increasingly, it's not seen as an important part of microcredit. And in Bangladesh, it's mostly gone by now. Um, in most other countries, it's mostly gone. So instead, we see other mechanisms coming to the fore, right? We understand the importance of repeat lending, that people are borrowing in order to get more loans in the future, irrespective of the group. And we also are seeing a greater understanding of the installment structure. So I'm going to spend you know, more time on this installment structure question, but it poses real questions. One of the strange things about microcredit was not just the group, but the idea that loans would be repaid every week or sometimes every two weeks, but regularly in small amounts over a year. That's a very strange way to have a business loan. And I want to come back to that part of microcredit um, and what it means going forward. But that's where we went on on, uh, on group lending. So these ideas have all come together. There have been many pioneers, including Sewa um, in India with El Abad, Muhammad Yunus, of course, Vijay Mahajan uh, at Basics, um, in Hyderabad, um, all of them starting different kinds of programs. And now, of course, there are many, many, many more pioneers and many, many more versions um, and self-help groups, etc. So microcredit has been going forward. And as we learn about it, we've started to collect better data on what it actually does. Does it actually empower women? Does it actually lead to more business investment? Does it actually increase incomes in the way that was expected?
So before going to those formal econometric studies, I want to go back to um, just some expert views which got lost in, um, in these conversations. So when loan officers were asked, you know, how do your customers do, right? And this was, there was a survey in, of loan officers in Bolivia. How are they doing with microcredit? This is as far back as 1996. They said, well, you know, most customers actually, their lives are very much the same. They're unchanged. So 60 to 65%, they said roughly the same. But the top end, there's about a quarter that does very well, that can take this opportunity and thrive. And then there's another group that doesn't do very well, maybe 10 to 15%. That was very sobering evidence because Muhammad Yunus and others had said, everyone can be an entrepreneur. Everyone can thrive with microcredit. That same question was asked um, by Basics. Vijay Mahajan had his, uh, who was the, the founder of Basics, um, asked his loan officers and his staff um, to, pr to get a sense of how everyone was doing. And they thought maybe half of people were doing better but half were either staying the same or moving backward. And that led Mahajan and Basics to reformulate what they were doing. This evidence was a radical break from, I think, expectations and a radical break from the idea that the diminishing marginal led profit functions are upward sloping and um, that the poorest household should do best. So what was missing and how does this connect to what we now understand from more recent impact studies. So if we go back to the profit functions like this, and this is capital on the, the bottom again and profit on the um, vertical axis, and we have focus with microcredit on the bottom end where it looked like there were incredible returns. But something's missing, right? And it could well be that what's missing is skills, complementary um, connections, networks, more broadly, that are important for entrepreneurship. So it could be that there are some parts of the market that have those skills and networks and connections and education, and they can thrive. But there's another group that's represented by the lower profit function um, that just will never really thrive um, through microcredit. And so Muhammad Yunus's assertion that microcredit is really the target market is frustrated entrepreneurs. It's only true for some households who really um, can move forward. And that's the sense in which the idea of diminishing marginal returns to capital in the simple sense that I described before, it was holding too many things constant. But we can see that those things, skills, education, networks, connections, are not evenly distributed. So that's one thing, and it pushes often microfinance toward better off customers. It says, it says that the better off customers, the better off borrowers may in fact be the ones who can earn the highest profits, not the poorest. That's a profound shift. Add to that evidence from recent RCTs. And this is a group of RCTs that has been much discussed in the newspapers, but also in the academic literature, a set of RCTs that were published in 2015 in the American Economic Journal, Applied Economics, from around the world, including from Spandana in South India. Um, and if we focus on Spandana, for example, uh, this was an expansion of Spandana, which has started in rural areas, moving into Hyderabad, a place where there was, at that point in 2013, 14, 15, um, a lot of competition. And so Spandana was coming in and adding resources, adding microcredit into communities where there were other players. And what the researchers found was that, in fact, microcredit did lead to more business investment, right? more inventory, more assets. And yet if one looked at profit levels, if one looked at income levels, if one looks at household consumption, on average, really very little noticeable impact. There was some for borrowers who had existing businesses, but most borrowers had very little impact at all. That was sobering. That was a stunning 
set of results. And we saw it not just in India, but in Mexico, Mongolia, Morocco, the Philippines, Ethiopia, Bosnia, all of those studies for the most part found very little impact at all on household income, mixed results on consumption, a little bit maybe on business profit. And if there was anything, it was only for existing businesses. And so the impact studies were starting to complicate this early vision that we had that microcredit was all about serving frustrated entrepreneurs who sort of by economic logic um, had very high profit potential. This suggested that that wasn't really there. I'm gonna come back to a big puzzle this creates. And the biggest puzzle really is if this is true, and I, I think we're still gathering evidence, but if this is true, then why do people continue to borrow from microcredit? If household income's not going up, if business profit's not going up, why do people continue to borrow from microcredit? That becomes the big question. So briefly, one response is, it could be that actually the results are better um, than, than, than this evidence suggests. And for example, we have evidence um, from uh, Andhra Pradesh after um, the microcredit crisis that happened, um, actually this was in 2010, um, after the excesses at the market, it was overheated, there were a lot of bad loans being made, a lot of people suffered, and in October 2010, there was the ordinance in Andhra Pradesh which stopped microcredit lending and researchers were then able to go back into Hyderabad, into other parts of Andhra Pradesh, survey customers who had once been microcredit customers, survey others and see what had happened before and after. And in a really interesting paper by Emily Brezza and Cynthia Kinnan, we see that after microcredit was shut down, that it's associated with drops in daily wages for workers, drops in household wage earnings, drops in household consumption. So this suggests that when microcredit was in place, that all of those uh, measures, all of those outcomes were actually higher. That once microcredit was taken away, um, we start to see drops in consumption. So that's much more positive in terms of impacts. It's still a mixed bag. Um, and still trying to figure out the story, but the impact studies at least are, um, are sort of complicating the story that had been in place um, from the early days. And so the, uh, really what I want to say here is what, they're, what the impact studies are doing is pushing us to ask, um, if those impacts aren't so clear or are not clear for everybody, why are people um, continuing to borrow? That is the big question. And that's gonna take us to an issue around um, the nature of microcredit contracts. And that's gonna lead us to a very different view of what microcredit does and should do. So I'm gonna stop again. I'm gonna stop right here and see if there are any other questions or um, clarifications. Um, and then I wanna talk about this issue. Okay. Uh, is there any questions? No, I think in that case, you can continue. Okay. So let me continue. So the, there are two puzzles here, really, at this point. So one is, if you don't have joint liability, if the groups aren't really functioning in the way that um, had been hoped, and in some cases, the joint liability has been totally removed, then how are the loans being repaid? But the more, I think, sort of fundamental question is, if the impacts that were expected in terms of household income, household consumption, business profits, if they're not really there, why do people continue to borrow? And a related puzzle is if this is really a business loan, why would it be structured like this? 
the way that the typical microcredit loan is structured, and this is an example of a Grameen Bank loan, is that you get your loan, and then immediately, a week after, you start repaying it in small increments, week by week by week by week by week. Now, we don't question that because that is the way it works, and this is what we see, and it seems very successful. But if we stop and think, well, if you really were running a business, you'd really want to take your loan, and you'd want, sorry, you'd want a chance to invest, generate a profit, and only then would you want to repay it. So instead of repaying it all the way through month, in all those months where you're investing, you would want to have some time in order um, to grow your business and then repay, and then you're able to pay profit from whatever surplus you have. But instead, we have this structure. And from an economic perspective, it's very strange. And in fact, it looks like a, um, it looks really like a consumer loan where you pay back in small amounts, um, but you're really borrowing to uh, you know, buy a microwave, buy a new telephone, buy, um, buy some consumer durable. That's what it looks like. But why, why is microcredit structured this way if it's meant to be a business loan? So it's odd and it has some advantages. Um, but I'm gonna skip over that in the interest of time, but I should just say it helps build relationships with banks, it allows um, the bank to see if there are problems coming up because when there, are, there may be problems with early installments and the bank and the micro lender could um, see that soon. Um, but let me, uh, let me just focus on a few elements of it. Okay. Um, the first part of it is that when we think about those interest rates, right, 24% or whatever they are, those interest rates are also broken down into small bits. And so it, it doesn't seem like it's such a big interest rate because it's just you know, a few pennies every week. And so that is one of the reasons um, that microcredit institutions are able um, to charge such high interest rates because they break them down in, into small bits which are more affordable. But there's something else and that is that this indeed does look like a consumer loan. At the top, I have the structure of a Mexican consumer loan, Banco Azteca. They do the same thing, but it's clearly a consumer loan. You can buy a toaster, you could buy a, a small appliance, and then borrow this way and pay it off over a year. It looks very much like the Grameen Bank loan, which is supposed to be a business loan. So one of the profound understandings that is reshaping how we understand microcredit is that in fact microcredit loans are not being used for business or not exclusively being used for business which is why um, perhaps those impact studies come out the way they do. So maybe 10 or 15 years ago as part of a project called uh, Portfolios of the Poor Collecting Financial Diaries um, with colleagues in Bangladesh, India and South Africa um, the work in India completed by Orlando Rutherford, the work in Bangladesh completed by Stuart Rutherford. And Stuart Rutherford went back to Grameen Bank borrowers and found that in a, in a, a small sample, admittedly, that roughly half of the loans were used for productive purposes, but um, the other half were not. Um, they were used for consumption. And in fact, most borrowers were using um, microfinance uh, mostly for consumption. And so this early hope that microcredit would be about all about production did not pan out. So an example, and this is looking at a particular feature of, of microcredit uh, at Grameen Bank. One of the borrowers used the microcredit you know, to buy food when she needed it, to prepare for the coming monsoon season. Another loan was used to pay for funeral expenses. Another because she had a, a private loan that she wanted to pay down that was quite expensive. Another time she had medical treatment, um, needed to buy grain, and another time um, used the money for school fees and again for food. That kind of pattern we see in many, many places. A study by Isabel Guerin, Santosh Kumar, and Isabel Agier looking at um, self-help groups in South India found that business purposes were only accounted for about 5% of what the loans were being used for. 
otherwise the money was being used for education, for health, for housing, etc. And women, instead of being frustrated entrepreneurs, understood that starting a business is risky and difficult and they may not be well positioned for it. We see it in other places. Um, this is work from Indonesia. About roughly half the loans were being used for business, um, half for consumption. Um, Mongolia, similar kind of things. Microcredit being used for durables, household assets, radios, large domestic appliances. Peru, similarly, um, about a third of the time being used for health, education, household items, etc. So that gets us um, to a question. The design of microcredit turns out to be a flexible design, which is not particularly designed for business investment. In fact, it is designed for general purposes. In practice, that is what's happening. Even though the rhetoric is around business, the practice is actually around borrowing, being able to borrow and repay in small amounts week by week. Um, that makes sense if you're even borrowing for consumption, even if you don't have a business. Now, money is fungible. So if you borrow for consumption here, you could use other money for business. So it allows money to be used in different ways. And that's really the point. The one of the successes of microcredit may be that it departs from a, the original rhetoric, but allows people to finance their lives, finance complicated lives in general ways. And that can be very powerful in a way. And I will leave a question for you and I'm gonna stop in a moment again. Um, and the question is really, does it matter? Is that, is that okay? Does it matter that borrowers are not using the money entirely for business? Does it matter that some of the money is going to these other uses? Now, before stopping, I wanna say that, you know, this could have profound implications for the future of microcredit. Because this, these same structures can then be meaningful for people of jobs. So rather than focusing on entrepreneurs or people with small scale businesses, microcredit really like this could be used for people who have jobs, but still who need to be able to finance the complicated things in their lives, to be able to finance healthcare, be able to finance education, be able to finance um, consumer durables, buying a new telephone, other things which you know, may be considered necessities today. And that means there may be people who are cooks and factory workers and drivers and people working in hospitals and construction workers, all of whom need finance, but not for what Muhammad Yunus had described, not for entrepreneurship, but really for basic household money management. Our work with Financial Diaries suggests that that is an elemental challenge of living on unstable income um, with low resources, but it has been diminished by all of the focus on microcredit as a business tool. And so I wanna stop again to see if there are any questions or issues um, before just moving on with one last um, broad point. So Zakir, I'll stop here again. Yeah. Okay, I think Indra has a question. May I just yeah, good. Yeah, uh, more of a comment, Jonathan. Um, uh, obviously, the last question you posed um, would, you know, provoke a lot of comments, at least a lot of thoughts. Uh, I, 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 I was thinking, can we not even extend this question a bit further and talk about um, more uh, like public good type of spending? something uh, which is not entirely individualistic, but perhaps improve, um, let's say, something that helps uh, quite a few households, uh, like infrastructure. Uh, what stops them to take a loan um, as a cooperative, for example, and do something that would help um, in, in uh, many households together? That's an interesting question. Does that make sense at all? I mean, I, 
my first reaction is that you know some of these things um, like ex education expenditures in fact have a lot of externalities and by their nature even though they're individual investments or choices paying for schooling they do have spillovers to the community the idea of collective investment is interesting um, but of course you know we have a, a large literature that you know on public goods and why it's important why there are coordination failures um, with public goods. So it, but I, I think that these kind of questions get opened up once we start to move away from thinking about this in terms of strictly entrepreneurial terms. So it's an interesting avenue. Is that here? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, there is a question by Ayush Mitra, but before that, uh, I would just like to raise one point. I mean, the microcredit, the basis of microcredit is the assumption that capital is the labor, is the constraint. But in the case of women, at least, isn't labor also a constraint in the sense that there are uh, very strong restrictions on their mobility? They have to perform uh, a lot of household duties which restricts their uh, potential labor hours, which they can supply to a possible business. I mean, in Bihar, for instance, uh, for instance, the mobility restrictions are so much that a woman who is a member is not even allowed to go to the SAG meetings. It is her mother-in-law who goes and gives the money. So in this situation, shouldn't we focus more on capital also? Oh, sorry, labor also. Yes, <laughs> yes is the answer. <laughs> yes is the answer. I mean, it's, it's interesting. There was a paper by Stiglitz and um, and some of his colleagues, which I don't think has ever been published, which sort of made that argument that one of the reasons why microcredit is focused on women in a way is because women are so constrained. Um, but then the other side of it is by being constrained, their opportunities are constrained as well, right? And so absolutely so focusing on the labor market side I think is, is crucially important, which may well be why the borrowing that we see, so much of it is in fact diverted to consumption rather than um, investment because you know, consumption is something that and cash management, household cash management is something that um, that's important and that then takes precedence if labor markets are such that uh, it undermines business opportunities. Does that, does yes. that make sense? I mean, I, I think in general, so I was going to make two points going forward. And I think in the interest of time, I may just uh, sort of quickly summarize them. Um, one is that these, these contracts with the regular repayment schedules, A, actually, and we have evidence from Calcutta um, that you may be familiar with, the work of Erica Field and Rohini Pandey and John Papp and Natalia Rogol, right? a very nice paper from 2013 looking at a microfinance institution in Calcutta, where if you, if you give people more time to invest, right? if you give a grace period of two months to invest before the repayments start, in fact, we see um, we see more investment, we see more profitability, et cetera. We also see more risk. So their argument is that, in fact, the, the structure of lending itself constrains entrepreneurial possibilities. And I think that argument's even more powerful when we add your observation, right, that the nature of labor relationships and family obligations are also constraining and that that's another reason why, in fact, microcredit is used in, in ways other than what the rhetoric would suggest. Uh, thank you. There's one question. Uh, shouldn't microcredit eventually improve education and skills of the poorest, resulting in better returns? That's interesting. You know, that was, that was always Muhammad Yunus's um, notion, right? That microcredit 
it's a quick way. People people already know what to do. They could just grow a small business, and that will increase education because as people get richer, they can afford um, to invest more in their children they, and and themselves, build more skills, build more education, and eventually returns would um, continue increasing. So Muhammad Yunus's vision was very much along those lines. I think that what we see in a sort of more competitive world is that that's not so clear, right? That education is, um, you know, there's this, there are supply side constraints, not just demand side constraints. So Eunice's vision that um, acquiring education will just happen in the course of things is less clear. And beyond that, I think what's left out is that even as you get education, I mean, as you get education, you might see that your your better options are as a worker rather than as a entrepreneur. And and as that happens, then microcredit becomes less useful for you, except as a cash flow mechanism, as a way to manage um, consumption, um, not for business, because you're less as you become more educated and more skilled and you know are more competitive than in employment situations um you uh, you uh, you don't need microcredit for entrepreneurship <laughs> i'm not sure if that was entirely clear but I, I i think this nexus of issues is important and not well understood but it's not obvious um that education and skills will increase over time in the way that was at least originally imagined If anything, one may argue that causality may go the other way. You need a bit of yeah. education and awareness to uh, be, uh, you know, uh, efficient with the microcredit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that was really the point I was trying to make with the, the two production, two profit functions. Um, yes, that's absolutely right. And it's not just education, it's, you know, it's also connections, it's networks. Um, that Eunice had asserted that anyone can be an entrepreneur and that everyone will thrive. And in fact, what we see is that there are these complementary inputs, um, which had for too long been ignored, which gets us to the question, then why do people, people keep borrowing if they don't have all of those complementary inputs? And I think the answer is, is taking seriously that a lot of the borrowing is not for business. It's really for household consumption. And what I want to then go to is how, how should we think about that? Um, and can we embrace it? And actually, can we see it as a different kind of future for microcredit? So maybe I should just continue for a moment um, and then just take a quick and then, then really end. Um, I just want to say one one final thing, and it'll really just be five minutes, um, which is if we go back to these the structure of microcredit with these regular repayment schedules and week by week meetings, you know, we get to this question, are they too regular? And one of the you know, one of the understandings increasingly is you know, these regular repayment schedules can put huge burdens on borrowers when they have difficulties in their lives, right? If someone gets sick, if there's you know a need for money for some other purpose, they still are expected to make those weekly payments. And then they have to borrow for them or um, you know, otherwise find the money. And so just one study I wanna highlight, um, which speaks to this, asks, well, what would happen if you had this structure, but you allowed people to have a, at least a couple weeks where they postpone their payments and they just instead reschedule to the end and you build that into the structure. And that has been tried um, at BRAC where you know your the green bars here are your cash flows, they go up and down. You may have some difficulties twice and so you're allowed to skip them. As you see here, those two times, you're allowed to skip those repayments, add them to the end. So starting to understand and embed microcredit in the realities of people's lives um, shows one way that you know this product and this approach could be improved. So this was tried in Bangladesh by uh, 
a group of authors, um, Baragalia, uh, Batalia, Goleski, and Mandistam. Um, and in Bangladesh, they find that creating a bit more flexibility within the structure, um, sorry, um, I'm now skipping too fast, um, gave borrowers more confidence, allowed them to invest more in business assets, went up by about half, 87% increase in revenues, 25% larger profits, 80% more volatility because they were taking greater risks. Um, we could start to see that um, with more flexibility, without this rigid structure, borrowers then felt more comfortable um, optimizing investments um, without worrying about doing the least risky thing. So we see improvements in business outcomes, um, the value of loans, the scale of lending, and ultimately per capita consumption, et cetera. So I'm gonna just close for today because it's already um, getting late. Um, and let me just skip, skip to the, um, the end. I'd already talked about this study in Calcutta. I think what we're understanding about the past of microcredit is that there were a lot of good ideas. They made a lot of sense. They came out of economic theory and they were embedded at a certain time in the 1970s and 1980s. And they made sense not just for you know, um, the pioneers, but also for the funders, often who are in the United States and Europe, who were helping to um, provide capital to get the microcredit off the ground. And eventually, you know, the funders, you know, in Delhi and other places where they were supporting these new institutions. But something has profoundly changed. And the future of microcredit and the understanding of microcredit could look very, very different. And what has changed is that the impact studies, not just the RCTs, but studies before that also, were showing that not everyone is benefiting in the way that had been hoped. In fact, not everyone is investing in the way that had been imagined. And that's not necessarily a failure for microcredit. That is an opportunity to understand household needs better. And it shows us that household needs um, are one for complementary inputs. And as we've been discussing, maybe education, maybe labor market changes. That those complementary inputs are important, that's one. Two, that the structure itself may be constraining what households are doing. And we saw it, I briefly mentioned the RCT from Calcutta, where the grace period was allowed. And I just mentioned this RCT from Bangladesh, where adding flexibility, it allowed for um, borrowers to do more and invest more productively. So complementary inputs, the structure itself. But the third thing is embracing the fact that people need to manage their finances. It's complicated, the world's difficult. I use a credit card all the time, a debit card. We all use these kind of financial devices to improve our consumption and make it easier. Poor households need those kinds of mechanisms more than richer households. And microcredit becomes one way in practice that they can do that. Now, some people say that's terrible, they should be investing in business. But I think a more realistic and a more constructive view is, no, we have to understand what households need and follow their own optimization, but try to make sure that there are consumer protections and education around it. And with that, and that's my, my very last thought, is that we had started with the idea that microcredit can be emancipatory, can liberate people from poverty traps, and what we see as we understand microcredit in people's lives is that for some it can. And for some it can do that by helping grow businesses. For others it can help by helping manage um, spending and deal with health emergencies and education expenditures. But for some, and women in particular, it can reinforce burdens on women as being the household debt manager and that's a real concern and anthropological and ethnographic work is showing that increasingly. And so this, in some sense, this simple innovation that we started with ends up being much more complicated. But to understand it, 
we need to take it apart and reimagine it. And you know, I, I know that many of you are in the process of doing that. And I hope that the comments today, this presentation today, has been helpful in putting ideas together and at least provoking a few thoughts. So I will end there. And I thank you for your attention to what was, I know, a long presentation. And I will stop sharing. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, everything seemed so simple, but at the same time, uh, your lecture really provoked, raised a lot of questions, including the fundamental uh, nature of microcredit, its future, its limitations. Uh, I mean, I really wish that uh, our research fellows would, uh, I mean, learn from this. I hope they do learn from this and let it, let your lecture guide their own research. So if there are any, I think there's one question by uh, Shomi Lee Banerjee. Uh, she's asking that how, uh, can you take any questions? You said that it was getting late. For me, I'm fine. For me, it's the morning. For you, it's getting late. So uh, I, I appreciate that you're you're still staying and it's, it's dinner time. So I, I will try to keep this compact, but I have time. Um, well, in short, how, what is the impact of digitization? How does it affect the older ideas of constraint? And as the information becomes more accessible, more women may be less held back by society. With regard to digitization and, and such. So this will have to, <laughs> this is another big conversation. And, and again, I, you know, I had really had to be selective today and um, there's a lot to say about digitization, but I will say this, um, digitization is exciting. I mean, a lot of people are, are thinking hard about how to make it work with microcredit. I think increasingly, as we, we see across the board, digitization allows there to be a lot more information and one can use that information on credit repayments for individuals and create big data and then create credit scores of individuals right? that will allow further lending. That's the way that most people, most lenders are seeing the possibility of digitization. It's not just a kind of more efficient way to send money, but it's also a way to collect information on customers, use that information to create profiles of the customers and use those profiles to lend more. I think that that's really exciting. However, it's also risky. And I think what we see in West Africa, East Africa, where digitization is sort of preceded in this way, um, is that often it can lead to excluding people because those profiles that are created based on this big data um, end up not just identifying people who might be good credit risks, but these algorithms are also pushing people out, excluding people from further lending. Um, and I think we really need a way uh, to address this. So digitization is exciting, but I think there's some risks. The other risk is that all of this data about individuals is now being held by companies. We all worry about our data. I think we also need to have some clearer consumer protections in place so that with digitization, customers, particularly the most poor and vulnerable customers, their privacy is maintained, their data is maintained, and they have more agency to control that. Here. Yeah. Any other questions? I mean, you can unmute yourself and ask it directly. Jonathan, I noticed um, the slides you have skipped. Uh, you had something on experiments. You're going to um, tell a bit more about experiments or uh, next time? So the slides I skipped were, um, uh, thanks for that question. <laughs> the slides I skipped were something I had described briefly, which is that that paper by uh, uh, Erica Field and Rohini Pandey and um, John Papp and Natalia Rogol, where the, the RCT in Calcutta, where they 
gave some people a couple months to invest before insisting on repayments. I think the the experiments have been interesting. We're like trying to take apart contracts and try new ideas. I think it's very um, positive. I think where I have questions about some of the experiments are really more about the impact studies, right? Where to do an experiment, you have to kind of look at some unusual setting where you can actually run a randomized trial. And then it's unclear how to extrapolate from, from those studies. They're, you know, an unusual situation, a new context. They don't, they tell us something about kind of a marginal impact, but they don't really tell us the, what the average impact of microcredit is on sort of established borrowers. They tell us something about new borrowers. And in many ways, our questions are really about the sort of historical long-term impact on existing borrowers. And so I, I, I'm a big believer in these uh, randomized control trials. We're in the middle of a number of them. Um, but I worry about over-interpreting some of the impact studies. Is that, Indraji, is that? <laughs> Does that respond to your, your query? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, students, if you want, you can unmute yourself. That will save some time. No, uh, I think everyone has cleared their doubts. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, the questions were really good. I really very much appreciate having these questions, and I wish I had more more time to really respond um, in a way that the questions deserve. And, I mean, thank you very much, Jonathan, for accepting our inv invitation. Uh, um, wonderful lecture. It's a great start to the new year, yeah. I think. It's a great start. Yeah. yeah. The ending was oh. also very good. It is almost like, you know, teaching the thing, you know. So we yes. felt it's more like, you know, it's a class kind of thing. You know, really we enjoyed the thing. Well, thank you very, very much. It was really an honor to be with you um, this evening. And uh, I, I really appreciate it. And I hope that some year when the world is a little more normal, um, we'll have a chance to meet up in person. So thank you all. Thank you very much. And if you are in India, please welcome to our department. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Okay, then. Thanks, thank, you, John. John. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Good evening. Bye. Thank you. So we are closing the meeting.